בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. שוב תורה. ברוכים הבאים. We're back to our uh, Tuesday night in Avin Torah. Era of Mashiach uh, series. ברוך השם, the series has been uh, most popular of all. Um, at least uh, these last several weeks, lots of people have uh, uh, start, stopped watching the news and instead just watched the series. Not only because it's more interesting, but also uh, the, uh, the news repeats itself, whereas the Shiu, uh, Baruch Hashem, has new chidushim each time. And you're really seeing everything that's happening in the world today, whether it be the religious world or non-religious world. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, we're seeing in the world today was already um, mentioned by our prophets thousands of years ago, was also mentioned by our sages, such as Rav Wasserman, Allah Shalom, and his Rebbe, the Chafetz Chaim, uh, nearly a hundred years ago. And uh, on one hand, it's extraordinary uh, how beautiful our Torah is, but on another end, it's a, a little discouraging that we continue to fail in learning the lessons from our forefathers, even though it's one of the mitzvot of the Torah, is to follow the footsteps of our forefathers, follow the footsteps and the lessons from our fathers. And uh, unfortunately, as a nation, we have not been able to do that uh, at the best possible level because we keep failing the same exact thing. Now, uh, tonight, we're going to talk uh, more about the uh, cause of the constant failure that the uh, Rav Wasserman has been uh, talking about over the last couple of weeks, which is the uh, shepherds, uh, but with some new insights and some new clues as to how to spot a uh, false shepherd that uh, he so warns us about and how to spot a uh, righteous shepherd, a good one. Um, of course, there's new problems in the world that I'll tell you about. Unfortunately, I have to be the news for that too. Um, but uh, also a little bit of good news too. Oh, Hashem. So tonight's show will be for a refuah uh, shlema. So Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, David Ben Esriya Doris Bat Jora, Esther Bat Zipora, Serach Bat Batya, Batya Bat Sara, Dvora Bat Mercedes, Elisheva Chaya Bat Sara, and Yitro Ben Avraham, Talia Bat Sara, and uh, all of Am Yisrael Bezot Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. If I forget people from time to time, I apologize, but you're in my mind, I just don't remember. Um, the, uh, the book here, Ikvita de Meshicha, Era of Mashiach, which I remind you again is on our website to download for free. Uh, has been really uh, an exceptional limut for me personally, even though I've learned it before. It's a, um, every time you go over the Divrei uh, Chazal, or Razal, either the uh, sages from, you know, a couple thousand years ago, or even recent sages, there's always more to learn, and especially when you delve into the words that they chose, why they said this, how they said this, and also as you continue to learn more and more, you end up connecting a lot more dots. And, uh, but at the same token, the Siyat Dishmaya that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us with no limit has uh, also uh, been exceptional just simply because you see the world around you and how it's changing and what's going on in the world, how frustrated people are with, uh, with the current situation, whether it be from the uh, financial crisis, health crisis, or even the uh, religious crisis. Many people are contacting us right now. Baruch Hashem, new Baalei Tshuva, new stories, new people that are newly inspired, and you get to learn, you know, some things about them, of uh, how did they get to this place, in a, in a, you know, in the first place? Why do they have to be inspired? And... Uh, to my surprise, many of them are not coming um, just from secular backgrounds like uh, I did and perhaps some of you did. Many of them also are coming from from backgrounds. They used to be religious. They grew up religious. But uh, 
they uh, got discouraged by these false shepherds. I have a uh, mother uh, contacted me a few days ago, and this unfortunately is not the only story, who told me that when she was homeschooling her kids, you know, I know her already for a few years, and she was homeschooling her own kids, and she wouldn't uh, have enough praise to say about her kids, how righteous they were, how great they were doing. But then she decided to sign them up to schools, and the only school that was available uh, where she lives was a modern Orthodox school. And she figured, okay, the rabbis, you know, seem like nice people, and uh, the school is well built and put together. So she signed up the kids, and you know, if, if there's anything missing, or perhaps we need to be a little more stringent, whether it be modesty or this or that, we'll fix it at home. Well, unfortunately, just the other day she comes back and she tells me that uh, her son, who's been going to this modern Orthodox school, has declared himself an atheist. And I say, how does somebody go from being ultra-religious, zealous for Hashem, when he's homeschooled, to going to school and becoming an atheist? How does such a thing happen? And she starts explaining to me how the rabbis confused him and then didn't know how to answer the, uh, the questions that he had. And before you know it, he was lost. Now, if this was the only story, I probably wouldn't even tell you. Probably wouldn't even tell you. But unfortunately, this is happening way too often. And as I've said before, and I know Rabbi Mizrahi has been saying for years, right now the, uh, the gap between authentic Orthodox Judaism and everything else is only getting greater. Now, not because of the name. There are plenty of fakers within the Orthodox community, uh, which I've discussed before. But I'm talking about what Judaism is supposed to be versus what it's become, whether they call it Masoti, or they call it uh, Masorbi, or they call it a, uh, you know, uh, uh, open orthodoxy, or modern orthodoxy, or some type of orthodoxy. There's also a new one, uh, Lapid, Lapid Judaism, which is, by the way, Christianity, just, but it's called Lapid Judaism. And it's Messianic Judaism, which is also Christianity. So a lot of things called Judaism, lots of them. The gap between authentic Judaism and everything else is getting greater and greater in some aspects. But by the looks of it, you won't be able to tell. Like if you look at the people, you won't be able to tell so much. With the exception, let's say, for example, some people are machmirim. Machmirim on Sarah Mitzvot. Like for example, the modern Orthodox are machmirim. They're very, very stringent on being immodest. Very, very stringent. They have to be like all the way. Like the rabbi next to my uh, house, he has a shul the size of uh, 10 of these buildings. His wife walks around l less modest than everybody else. Machmira. She's machmira. She's very stringent on being immodest. No kisui rosh and no kisui goof either. Nothing. That's the rabbi's wife. Just imagine the keila. You know, they have a mechitza uh, there that's like uh, a fishnet. A fishnet, you could see, you could see uh, less through that than the mechita they have. But they call them, you know, orthodox. They call themselves orthodox or modern or whatever they call themselves. The point being is that you cannot, you're not going to be able to tell by the look so much because there are Christian organizations like this Lapid or Messianic Judaism where they have adopted the Hasidish look, many of them, so you're going to see a lot of them walking around peyot. And some of them with nice big hat. And with the stream and everything. They're going to look, beard, it goes for free. So everybody has it. But they're not even Jewish. They're not even Jewish. And there's some people that they pretend to be in a process of conversion on their own, by themselves, in the middle of Montana or something. In the middle of nowhere, their next door neighbor is a horse and a cat, and maybe a frog. But on the internet, they start giving shurim. They give shurim. They give lectures. They want to give people dvar Torah. You ask them, oh, Abu Hashem, who's not Jewish. The way they look, Hasid Breslev. So the looks are going to confuse you. Looks are going to confuse you. Can't tell by the looks. 
Same concept goes with certain people, certain speakers, certain rabbis, certain keilot. Sometimes I've met some of the most wonderful people that dress just basically normal people. You know, they have, you know, uh, uh, normal clothes. They don't look like they're uh, Hasidim. They don't look like they're the most religious. But you look, you talk to them five minutes, you know this person has Yirat Shamayim that you're jealous of already. How much Yirat Shamayim they have, Baruch Hashem. You ask them a few questions, they give you 75 different answers because of how much they learn, Baruch Hashem. So the looks are going to be deceiving. Uh, and the only way you're really going to know whether someone is an authentic Jew before, you know, as things, you know, continue to progress is simply by their actions. Which means that we're, gonna, we're at a point now we're not going to be able to trust anyone at face value. Now you used to be able to look at someone Within five feet, if he's five feet from you, you could already know who is this guy, where he's about, what family he belongs to, what's the tradition there, and so on and so forth. And you can rely on it or run away from it. The Gemara says that Resh Lakish, who used to be a former gangster before he became Gdolado, he wouldn't talk to just anyone. Anyone he talked to, everybody, after he left the conversation, everyone would come to that person and start giving them money to do business with them. So why? Because Resh Lakish... He knew who all the gangsters were. He knew all the criminals. So he knew who to stay away from. Anyone he talked to had to be a tzaddik. So in those days you can tell if you had resh lakish. In previous years you could tell simply by the way people looked. Today it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to tell how people look. Because there's just so much falsehood. Even after first impression. I uh, always, you know, want to give people the benefit of the doubt when I meet them, you know, especially since, you know, when you first meet somebody, for some reason or another, they feel like they need to give you their resume of mitzvot. You know, so you met them, hi, how are you? You know, in the business world, the way it was is, hi, how are you? What do you do? Like, why do I care what you do? I don't care. But people ask that, what do you do? Why? Because they're sizing you up. How much money you make? How much money I make? Who has a bigger house? What do you do? What do you do? Where do you go? Where do you go? Where do you vacation? Where do you vacation? What do you drive? Do you drive? Who, do you have a driver? Stupid questions like that. That's the business world in, in general. Flawed world, but that's what it is. But in the uh, religious world, it seems it's a little bit similar. Same questions. What do you do? What do you do? But they also add something like this. They start telling you about their mitzvot. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I pray nets over there. Why do I care? Am I coming to pray with you? Why do I care when you pray? Did I ask you what time I pray? Where do you pray? Why do you care? You want to come with me? Because I'm there. Like, why do you care where I pray? Oh, it's, oh yeah, yeah, that shul, you know, I built it. You want to build another one? You want to donate to our shul? Like, what's the, what's, where, what's the nafkamina here? Why are you telling me what you built, what you did? To tell me all the donations they made and what kind of mitzvot that they do and who they learn and what they learn. And people tell you a lot about their mitzvot and it's a, uh, obnoxious. But it also comes from a little bit of insecurity, uh, a, a need to impress, um, but nonetheless uh, also uh, pride. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing to do good things. Obviously, you need to do good things. But when you feel the need to report into people, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing these good things? So I have something to tell people? Oh, because I generally want to do good things. So many times you meet certain people, whether they be rabbis or not, and they give you their resume about the, had this keila and that keila and this and that, and everything sounds good until at some point or another there's a moment of truth. And then you see who this person really is. Usually it has to do with one of a few things. One, popularity. When popularity is at risk, reputation, people are willing to sell their mother, father, brothers, and neighbors for the sake of popularity, for the sake of reputation. It's really disgusting, to be honest with you. And the crowd is used to it so much that their first threat is that if you're not going to do what I say, then I'm not going to watch you anymore. I'm not going to go there anymore. And people care. 
Second, money. Everything I just sold, sold already or double it. Second marriage. They sell the second marriage, second parents, second adoptees, everything else. People won't do everything for money. It's the craziest thing in the world. I had one time a guy tell me, uh, he was going to this uh, rabbi, this keila and so on. And uh, the rabbi asked him, what do you do? And uh, he says, oh, I do such and such. Oh, maybe you can help me out. That's what you do. You can help me out. What do you charge? Oh, I charge, uh, I don't know, $300 to do this job. You know what? Do it for me. Do it for me. You do it for me. He said, yeah, I need the extra money. Why not? So he does the job. Takes him a little while. It's not easy work. And he comes back to the rabbi. He goes, ego, I, I finished the job. Rabbi sees the work. Oh, Baruch Hashem. Very good. You do great work. Thanks. So the guy is like, you're welcome. Thanks, thanks. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. You know, you, what happens usually in like, you know, in the world, you work, you know, thanks, thanks, and, and there's usually an exchange, something else with the thanks. I don't really need the thanks, I need the money. I can pay rent. But it didn't happen. So he figured, you know, the, the guy was like, you know, he's kidding. He was like, oh, okay, maybe he forgot, or maybe uh, he doesn't have, so he'll give it to me tomorrow. Two, three, four, five days, nothing happened. So, you know, the, you know, the guy was struggling a little bit. So he said, uh, so he, I mean, I'm just going to ask him if he forgot or something. You think he gave it to me? So he says, uh, Rabbi, listen, remember uh, that job that you asked me to do for you? Yeah. Uh, I told you it's going to be $300. Oh, what, you, you, you wanted to charge me? I thought you just wanted to help the shul. I thought you just wanted to give something good back, back to the shul. I didn't, I didn't know you were going to charge me. That's a rasha. And that's stealing, by the way. That rabbi has to come back in a gilgul unless that Talmud forgives him. Because that's stealing. And it happens many times. It happens many times. For what? For a few dollars. When it comes to money, people, people do the strangest things in the world. That's number two. Popularity, money. Third, I'm sure all of you can guess, women. When it comes to women, all of, everybody wants to be popular with the girls. Even though he's married with 16 kids, he wants to be popular with the girls. He wants the girls to like him. He wants to have a shiur just for girls, just for women. He wants all the women around the world that he doesn't even know to like him and press like on his Facebook. He wants them to buy his books. He wants them to attend his lectures. He wants to be popular with the women. And he does a lot of stupid things. Based on that. Now, what do all three of these things have in common with the shepherds that Rav Wasserman has been talking about? Everything. These are some of the motivating factors that inspire the shepherds to do their wicked work. And Rav Wasserman continues after telling us that Akadosh Baruch Hu told the prophet Yechizkel Ben Adam, I need you to know, go to these shepherds that have been responsible for my sheep, responsible for my children, Am Yisrael, and tell these shepherds that the only reason they did not do tshuva, the only reason my sheep are not completely religious, completely bnei Torah, completely tzadikim and tzadikot, is only because of the shepherds. It's not because of the environment, it's not because of the weather, it's not because of the poverty, it's not because of the difficulties, it's not because of any of the other things. It's only because of the shepherds. And tell the shepherds, I'm going to take revenge against them. Now, if a person tells you, watch your back. Sometimes you want to make fun of it, just like, oh, I can't see. You know, nothing. Watch your back. Who are you? You're a human being. Put your pants one leg at a time, just like me. Unless he has a gun. Then you say it behind his back. But reality is, human being, big deal. If God tells you, watch your back. It's too late. And that's what the prophet Yechizkel told all of the wicked shepherds. Sadly, these wicked shepherds continue to reincarnate in every generation as the Gemara in Masechet Chayiga says, the Erev Rav, 
The Erev Rav have been one of the original creations of the world. And the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote the Torah 974 generations before he created the world is he knew that the world could not survive without the Torah for that long because the people would be too wicked in order to survive. And even having the oral Torah wasn't enough and he had to destroy the world at least once with the generation of Noah. But needless to say, all of those wicked neshamot had to be distributed throughout all of the generations. And the Zohar Kadosh says, and the Gemara confirms, that's the Erev Rav. They keep coming back in every generation, there's always going to be Erev Rav. And Erev Rav is not always going to be who you think. It's not always going to be Stalin and Hitler in Machshimo. It's not always going to be the communist. It's not always going to be the, the Obamas of the world or the Saddam Hussein of the world. It's not always going to be them. In fact, in the end of days, one of the symbolic differences between the era of Mashiach and all of the other times that we had throughout the last several thousand years, the Rebbe Misatmer says is that in this round, the main enemy is going to be the Erev Rav that are Jewish people. Now Jewish, halachically, as far as their mother is Jewish and so on, but ideologically and spiritually, obviously far, far removed. But some of them will come to you in a form of a lefty liberal Jew that hates the Torah, like this Rasha Merusha, a uh, journalist, news anchor uh, in Israel, his name was Amnon Levi Machshimo. His entire career is built on making fun of religious people. If it wasn't for religious people, he would be fired already long ago. Or other clowns that are like him in Israel, in America, whether it be the New York Times and uh, the uh, CNNs of the world, or different political figures that sadly are Jewish or it's going to come to you in the form of a so-called spiritual leader, a rabbi like this one uh, rabbi that uh, recently uh, he had a uh, temptation or temptation Somebody told him, if you could take care of this case and find a way for this woman to get married again, we'll, get you, we'll give you a job at the Bed Din Agadol in Eretz Yisrael, meaning the biggest Bed Din. What's the job? Look, this woman got married. Soon after she got married, her husband went into a coma. Shemishmo. Now, halachically, she can't get divorced. Why? Because divorce has to, the get has to be given by the husband. He can't give her a, a, a get if he's in a coma. So she has to, she's pretty much stuck. So everybody feels bad, which we do too. But Allah is Allah. Kadosh Baruch Hu knew this when he, made, when he told us this is what the Allah is supposed to be. He knew that this woman's going to exist and other women like her are going to exist, that they can't get remarried and so on, and they end up spending 20, 30, 40, 50 years with somebody they can't even be with either because of medical reasons or because the guy ran away and so on and so forth. It's a very, very sad scenario, but nonetheless, HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew this when he put this in the Torah. So, Allah she cannot get a get, she cannot get divorced. Which means she cannot be with another guy and even though her uh, husband is a, for lack of a better word, the translation from Hebrew is he's a plant. Meaning, can't move, can't speak, can't nothing. Tzemach, uh, that's what they call it. That's, uh, in, in English they say it's coma. Now, this uh, superhero wanted to find a way. Chidush. What's the chidush? It says there's two reasons why this woman is free to go. Number one, the uh, woman was 
only agreed to marry this guy based on him being alive. So the fact that he went into a coma shortly after, it's mekach ta'ut, meaning it's not a part of the original agreement. So therefore, the, the marriage is null and void. Complete hogwash. And then, on top of that, the beddin, his beddin, we're going to take control. We're going to take the ketubah as we're the owners of the ketubah. And we're allowing her to get divorced. Now, she didn't marry the beddin, though. She married the guy. But no, he thought this is a chidush. Many of Gdolei Israel that found out about this went against them. He completely, completely ignored everything. Rasha Merusha completely distorted the Torah. What was his reward? He got a job at the Bet Yiragadol. This is one of the big Rabbanim in the world. Just this past weekend, there was a uh, Torah event that Rabbi Ephraim was uh, part of. And uh, someone told him, listen, this rabbi is in this uh, hotel. Maybe you want to meet him. He's very connected politically, this and that. My friend says, chas v'shalom. I don't want to see him. I don't want to meet him. And I don't want to ever even hear about him. Such people like this, rashaim like this. Yeah, political corrections though. Political connections. The guy maybe gets you a job at the government. This be big rap. Chas v'shalom. But most people, they don't care about how this guy got the job. You get an opportunity to, be, to, to meet up. Ah, how are you? Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav. Yeah, I heard you're a very important rabbi. Completely ignoring the fact that he murdered the Torah in order to get the job that he has. This happens, unfortunately, regularly. When it comes to popularity, people are willing to sell the Torah for nothing. When it comes to money, people are willing to sell the Torah. In this case, it's all three. Popularity, money, and the girl. Why? Because what happens is, if you come out with a psaq like this, what happened to him after that? He became very popular. Look, see, what a real chacham we have. Because all the ignoramuses in the world, they don't know that he just destroyed the Torah. Oh, what a real chacham we have. That's the way to help these poor women that can't get remarried. See, he's a genius. He's a this, he's a that. That's like calling uh, Hitler a genius for eliminating uh, certain diseases by simply killing the people. Now, Rav Wasserman says in the uh, section of the same uh, part, section Yud Gimel, 13, says in a generation in which the son of David comes, meaning the generation of Mashiach, the face of the people will be as that of the face of a dog. This he's quoting a very famous Gemara from Masechet Sota, page 49b, and also Masechet Sanhedrin, page 90, 90a. Now he's going to give us the commentary on what does it mean, Pnei Ador Ke Pnei Akelev. Many Chachamim have delved into this and have given it new insights of how you see the generation of the Mashiach is the generation of the face of the face of the generation is the face of a dog. One time I uh, showed you guys a, uh, that scientifically it's also true where many people tend to look like their dogs. If you get a headshot of the dog, headshot of the people, they look alike. It's unbelievable. Strange, but unbelievable. Another aspect of it is that a dog has no manners whatsoever, has no shame whatsoever, and does his thing everywhere. The generation today, Hashem Yishmol V'yatzin, they do their business anywhere. And I don't just mean they do their business as far as the bathroom business. I mean all, all business. All business is open for business. Hashem Yishmol. No shame whatsoever. Someone... We were leaving the house today to run an errand. And some woman just came into my parking lot and came out. And, you know, as soon as she came out, I saw that she, she, she has the outfit of a dolphin. So my wife's like, well, yes, yes, the little lady, yes. She's like, oh, can not give you this flag? She gave me like a United States flag or something like that. No, no, we don't need a flag. 
okay. And she's just standing there like a whale. I, she thought maybe I'd throw her a fish or something. My wife got so upset, she wanted to yell at her. Like, how do you walk around like this? How do you walk around like this? She says, if we weren't in a hurry, I would have yelled at her. She didn't have the shame to walk around like this. But that's to her now, to the woman, she didn't do a single thing wrong. In fact, she thinks she did a nice thing. I was offering them a nice thing. I came over there to give them something. That was the problem. But the way you were dressed, yeah, it's brand new. This shirt cost me $390. What shirt? What shirt? You're not wearing a shirt. No, this is DKNY. This is Versace. This is Bachi. This is all types of jeans. Well, you should get a, at least half off because the shirt is half. She thinks she is dressed to impress. And most women walking around today with what the previous generation called underwear, most women that walk around today think that they're doing nothing wrong by walking around showing somewhere between 50 to 80% of their skin. They think there's nothing wrong with it. And today, it's so shameless that it's not even a matter of attraction or being lustrous or anything. It's anyone. Anyone. Like, I mean, as a, as a, logically speaking, if let's say someone is just uh, you know so beautiful and wants to show their uh, stuff to the whole world because they're they want to I don't know get hired for some job that's the oldest profession in the world, then okay. But when you're talking about someone that literally just left the zoo. Her and Free Wheelie are our best friends. And she's walking around like that. You don't understand. Like, where did you get the mirror? Where did you get the mirror that told you that you could wear that? You should get a refund. It, how many mirrors are there, by the way? Because how do you fit? Where did you get this stuff? But Rabotai, you're laughing. It's true, it's hundred percent. I'm just saying what's in your heads also. You don't understand what's going on with these people. And they walk around Mamas unbelievable. Now, this has always been absurd. I've always found this absurd my whole life. But it's more absurd today than ever because you're seeing some of this also in a Jewish world. You're seeing this in a non Jewish world. You're seeing this in a religious world. You've seen this in a non-religious world. In fact, it's come to the point where if you are modest, the way the Torah says, people tell you, you look weird. I've had quite a few young, men, young women tell me, listen, uh, I don't know, I, I, I got a whole new wardrobe and my friends were shocked. I said, why are they shocked? Well, because they said I look strange. I said, why, because you have clothes on? That's strange to them? They should try it. But that's the thing. If you don't have a clear understanding of what's appropriate and what's not, the foolishness around you could easily confuse you. Now, now if you're going to come to the, the rabbis, you're going to be disappointed. Why? Rav Wasserman tells us that the generation, generation of Mashiach, Pnei Adol ke Pnei HaKelev. Pnei Adol ke Pnei HaKelev. How is this connected to the rabbis? Wasserman says, it's a characteristic of the dog to run before its master. And it would seem that it goes on its own free will. The master following in obedience to the wishes of the dog. That's what it seems like. Guy is walking his dog, but the dog's running ahead of him, and it looks like the guy is actually following the dog. But in reality, we know that the reverse is true. The owner goes where he likes, and the dog, while preceding him, obeys his whim. Should the master choose another direction, straight away the dog turns also, and again proceeds to run ahead. Very simple. People walk around irresponsibly with a, no leash, because they think that their dog is everybody's dog. 
And they walk around, and a dog runs in front of them. Now, they don't care about the fact that other people are scared of dogs, or their dog may be scary. They walk. Dog's running. Now, it looks like the dog is running the show because the guy's following him. But in reality, if the guy decides to stop and turn around, little Rusty is going to turn around and follow him also. Right? That's what happens. So even though it looks like the dog is really leading the show, it's really the master. Now, in normal years, of Wasserman continues, when the people listened to the ruling of the Torah, the Gdolim, the sages, led the way. The Gdolim decided the direction to be taken and the people walked in their footsteps. The rabbi said, the people did. That's how it was for over 3,000 years. Even during the worst times, there were always some people that were religious, that were good. Rabbi says, they do. That's how it's always been. But in the years approaching the coming of Mashiach, something's going to change. What's changed? The sovereignty of the Torah will be usurped. The masses will choose their way as well as they can, and their leaders run ahead of them like the dog before the master. In the name of Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, which is who Rav Wasserman is quoting here, he says that throughout all of the years, the Gdolim, the sages, the Tamidei Chachamim, they led the way. They said, okay, we're going to start a community here. Everybody came. From now on, no more chalav akum. No more using the, the, the milk of the goyim, only chalav Israel. Why? We have enough money to do it, and so on and so forth. Which, by the way, as a side note, is a misunderstanding that many people had, and I had myself for, for, for some time, that the psaq by Rav Moshe Feinstein, that you're allowed to uh, have the milk of the non-Jews as long as it's a kosher, I always thought for some time that, uh, yeah, as long as it's kosher, you could have it. Even though it's raised by the goyim and so on, it's supervised by rabbis, it's kosher, it's kosher. No problem. Because what Moshe Feinstein said, they are allowed. He only said that, he only said that, if there is no way to get halab Israel. Meaning, if you, have, if you go to a supermarket, if you go to a supermarket, and you have two choices, you have kosher milk, by some non-Jewish company, and you have Chalav Israel, you are obligated to buy Chalav Israel. Now, if there's no Chalav Israel, but the other milk is kosher, allowed, no problem, no problem. But if you have access to Chalav Israel, have to buy it, have to get that. So, when Rav Moshe Feinstein said it, people initially understood clearly what I just said. And that's what they did. As time passed, all of a sudden, they forgot the second part. Forgot the second part. That, yeah, no, the, 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 uh, the other milk is okay. You can just buy it whenever you want, even if you have halab Israel, because I really like this one, especially since it's like half the price and this and that. And that's what happens. It says, throughout all of history, the Gdolim ran the show, and the people followed. But in the generation before Mashiach, the Torah will be embarrassed. The Torah will be ignored. The Torah will be disgraced. Because the masses will choose their way as well as they can. And the leaders run ahead of them like a dog. Meaning that the rabbis of this generation look like they're leading. They look like they're leading. He just came out with a new book. Oh, wow, who, who came out with a book? Oh, Rav Kanievsky came out with a new book. Psh, wow. Wow, Rav Kanievsky came out with a new book. Wow, Yishtabach Shemo, yeah, Rav Kanievsky. Sara Torah. Sara Torah, Gdol Ador. Finishes the entire Shaz Bavli. Shaz Yerushalmi. The Zohar. The Midrashim. Alvai in my life. I'll finish as much Torah as he does in one year. Alvai. Yeah, Rav Kanievsky. Rav Kanievsky. Yeah, you say Rav Kanievsky, people start to shiver. But then you say, but you know, uh, lady, you, you, you follow Afghanievsky? Yeah, Afghanievsky. Best, best, best rabbi. Biggest rabbi in the world. Okay. You know, Afghanievsky said that you're not allowed to wear a wig, right? 
Yeah, but I have my own rabbi. Wait, hold on a second. What? You just said for the last half hour you gave no end to the amount of compliments to Rav Kanievsky. But the second I told you that Rav Kanievsky says that the Whigs, right now, since most of them are coming from India, you are a Psak Alakha, not allowed. Whigs not allowed. Because they're coming from India. And that's after there's a video of him that we publicized also, of him saying in his own words, you don't even need the writing, you can see his own words saying it, any wig that looks like real hair is forbidden. You said, Rav Kanievsky, that's what you hold by, right? That's the biggest rabbi in the world, right? No. Yeah, but I have my local rabbi. But the rabbi, the Lubavitch rabbi said it's okay. Well, what does that have to do with anything? First of all, he didn't. Second, what does that have to do with anything? You just said, Rav Kanievsky is Gdolado. How come he's only Gdolado when it's not relevant to you? So as big as Rav Kanievsky is, as big as Rav Mutsafi is, as big as the Rishon Etzion is, as big as all of the rabbis that we have left in the world are, the reality is we don't have any unity whatsoever. People are simply making them look like they're the leaders, but in reality doing whatever they want. You have entire Sephardic communities. They say, no, who do you all? You're Sephardic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go by Rabbi Vadya. Yeah, 100%. So how come almost 90% of the women in your uh, community are wearing wigs? Rabbi Vadya says it's not allowed. Yeah, yeah, but we have, uh, you know, the, the, what there was, another rabbi said it is allowed. Yeah, but you just said that you follow Rabbi Vadya. You said you follow Rabbi Vadya. You said Rabbi Vadya is Kodosh Kodoshim. He's the Moshe Rabbeinu of the last few hundred years. So why is it when it came to this... You don't follow. Why are you talking like that? Why are you being so aggressive? Why are you doing... What does that have to do with anything? I'm asking you a question. And that's what happens, Rabbi Unfortunately, Rabbi Tai Rabbi Wasserman told us something that we've known all along. In the generation before Mashiach, the giants of the generation, the Gdolim of the generation, unfortunately, are going to be treated like dogs. Dogs that look like they're leading the way, but in reality, it's just for looks. The masters are going to be the people that have the money. The people that are in the kila, the community. People are going to do whatever they want. You tell them a ra big rabbi just came out with a book and said, okay, I'll buy it. Three months later, so what do you think of that book? No, I didn't get a chance to read it. But you bought it. Why don't you read it? I have it. When I get a chance. So what are you reading now? Not so, not, not, not so much. I'm busy with work. Also, you're reading nothing, but you have 800 books in your house. So why don't you just open a library? Books are to read, not to have as a collection. They're not furniture. But people like to write, buy books. Why? So when you go to the house, you can impress, look, yeah, see my collection. See my collection? All these animals? Look. Now... Rav Wasserman says, there are rabbis in our generation, he's talking about 90 years ago, there are rabbis in our generation who are drawn after the will of the congregation, striving to show how sociable they are, and descending from the peak to the depths. He says there are rabbis in his generation, Hashem Yishmo, if he was alive today, I think he would rip his clothes and just say, that's it, uh, there's Kaddish on the entire nation. He says in his generation, he says there's some rabbis. What are these rabbis? They are not treated like the Gdolim that, you know, you make pretend like you follow this rabbi. He says, no, no, the rabbis that are even worse. The rabbis themselves are acting like dogs. What kind of dog? Dog that's trying to please its master, do whatever. You want to throw a ball? I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. What else do you want me to do, Master? What else do you want me to do? Want me to do a, chase my tail for three years? Okay, I'll chase my tail. Want me to jump? I'll jump. Want me to sneeze? I'll sneeze. Want me to play dead? I'll play dead. He says, the rabbi is like that. To try to please the generation, get popularity by so, showing themselves at how sociable they are. Going to all of these bar mitzvot. Every day there's a new bar mitzvah. They show up to every event. Every day there's a new wedding, they show up to every event. 
Now, yeah, Chazaku Baruch, that you're a sociable rabbi and you go to a wedding every day and a, and a, and a, uh, and a bar mitzvah every day. When do you have time to study Torah, though? That's the question. Because that's part of the rabbi role. If you're going to a party every day, when do you study? When do you play rabbi? Where's the rabbi part? Because going to the parties, you don't have to be a rabbi. You can just be a member of the kila. But if you're at a new party every day, where's the rabbi role? One time, somebody came to Arab el Yashiv, and he helped, uh, Arab el Yashiv helped him a lot, and he said, Kvod Arab, Baruch Hashem, your blessing worked. We had a son. Ah, Baruch Hashem, Mazal Tov. And Kvod Arab, I just want to say, I'm sorry, I don't want to disrespect the Rav, but since the, uh, my, uh, uh, the other Rav, my Kila Rav, helped us a lot, I don't want there to be any machloket or anything, so I told him to be the sandak. I just hope that Rabbi, the Kvod Rav is not offended. Rabbi Yashiv laughs and he says, people think they're doing me a favor by making me a sandak for their brit milah of their kids. All they're doing for me is causing me bitul Torah. Who wants to go to these brit milahs? I want to learn Torah. But so, today, you don't have many of those. Today you have, Rabbi, go to Brit Milah every day. Breakfast, Brit Milah. Lunch, Bar Mitzvah. Wedding, that's for dinner. Every day. Every day. They have, never have to buy food. Why? Socially. In the business world, we used to call it networking. Networking. What do you do in a certain business? You want to build your business. There are two ways of building a business. One, old-fashioned way, cold calling. Call a bunch of strangers and convince them to do business with you. Very few people are willing to do it, and even fewer succeed. Very, very hard business. The other way is, the, in my opinion, the sellout way. It works over time to, for some people, but in my opinion, it's a complete waste of time. What is it? Networking. Networking. What's networking? Every day you go somewhere else. You go to a bar, you go to some event, you go to the networking events. And what do you do? You just look for friends. Because you, your friends are your customers. Oh, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You exchange business cards. And you don't know that he's, he's, he's starving, but he looks like he's got three-piece suit on. And you're starving also, but both of you think that you're going to feed each other. Neither one of you have money to close off the week, but you think that you're going to pay each other's bills. And both of you pretend. And every day they go to a different event. And in the afternoon, they go socialize. And they go to different fancy schmancy restaurants. Not because they can afford the food. They're living off of debt. Why? Because hopefully some rich guy is going to sit next to them and they can network. Network. Now, in the business world, when you act like a loser like this, fine, whatever. What else are you going to do? But when you're a rabbi and you act like this, we have ourselves a problem. There are literally countless rabbis that I know that spend their life constantly networking with the keila. They're at somebody's house every day for some reason. They're for either some type of event or some type of consulting or some type of uh, this or some type of whatever. They're constantly somewhere. Now, you ask them basic questions they don't know. And that's the reason. You don't have any time to learn Torah. If you want to be a socialite in today's world, it's very acceptable if you're a rabbi that's socialite. But in the real world, in the Torah world, it's completely unacceptable. The last thing you want to do is socialize with people if you want to be a leader. But that's what Rav Wasserman is saying that already in his time there were countless rabbis that were chasing after the congregation showing them that they are regular, regular people they're very sociable and take all of their learning all of the Torah that they had and yeshiva and all the things all the good stuff that they've acquired for the first 20 or 30 years of their life learning says from their peak, they go to the bottom of the barrel. Why? You don't learn to over extended period of time. You start forgetting stuff. 
you start disconnecting from it. The Yirat Shemaim that you had at 20, 21 year old young rabbi, by the time you're 30 years old, you forgot what it means even. The guy was in Kola, number one in class. 35 years old, he forgot that he's supposed to go to a bed dean instead of civil court. These examples are not made up. These are real examples. 20 years old, top of the class. Became a young rabbi. Few people believed in him. Gave him a beknesset, gave him a kolel. 35 years old, had a difference with, a different, with another Jew. Okay, I'm going to take you to civil court. But Jews don't go to civil court. Unless it's a crime that the law has to be involved, like rape and murder and uh, uh, things of that nature. That you have to go to the law. But when it comes to civil court, money, things like that, you have to go to Bedin. Going to a civil court is Chilul Hashem. Which the Kapara for it only begins at death. Now I have to go to a civil court. Every Talmud Yeshiva knows this. But the rabbi forgot. Why? Money's involved. Money's involved. Why? Forgot to learn. Forgot to learn. And that's what happens, Rabbutai Karim. When you spend too much time with the people and not enough time leading them. The Chafetz Chaim says that the generation before Mashiach, Pnei Adok Pnei Akelev, is explained in such a way where when you throw a stone at a dog, it will immediately attack the stone and bite the stone instead of biting the person that's throwing it. Now, this generation, you have a very unique situation right now. We were very, very confident as a people, as a species, at how things were going four months ago. Financial situation, the best it's ever been. Most people were making a decent living. Most people were at jobs. Unemployment rates were relatively low in the Western world and even around the world. Convenience was practically normal, whether it's a convenient car that turns on the station that you want in the radio as soon as you turn it on, or the seat realigning as soon as you sit on it, or your coffee being made at a certain time already pre-programmed ahead, or your temperature of your house adjusts as soon as you walk in. Convenience, very normal. Or the second you want something, all you gotta do is press a button and it arrives to your house within 24 hours. Convenience became very normal. Financial situation became very normal. Everything was good, everything was normal. Then, then comes Corona. Within a matter of weeks, the whole world shuts down. Something that most people have never even read about. You know, needless to say, seen. And people are still trying to figure out what to do. Do we go back to work? Do we stay at home? Is it worse? Is it better? Are they going to get a cure? Do we even need a cure? Is Bill Gates behind this or is it his partner? Maybe it's Steve Jobs coming back from the dead. Maybe it's the 5G somehow coming back into human form because people saw it terminated too, too many times and they think that a, uh, an internet uh, 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 tower can turn into a, a, a vicious monster somehow. Every single conspiracy under the sun has come out over the last few months. People have no clue what to do. Now, that's the rock. All of this is the rock. Instead of addressing the rock, we should be addressing who threw the rock. Who brought Corona? Why do we have Corona? Why do we have so much cancer? Why do we have so much other disease? Why do we have an unemployment rate that no one has seen in the last hundred years? Forty million people got fired just in America alone. Most of them are not going to get rehired anytime soon. Why is it coming back again even worse? Why is everybody so scared? No one's asking any of these questions. Everybody's focused on Corona. Financial situation, this, that, the rock. Now, had we had good leaders that tell us, don't worry so much about Corona, worry about who brought Corona. Don't worry so much about your financial crisis, worry about who caused your financial crisis. Don't worry so much about all of these different things that are rods and rocks, 
worry about who brought them to the world. If you had thousands of rabbis telling this to the people, guess what? We would be in much better shape today. But unfortunately, we don't. What do we have instead? I'll give you a couple of examples of what we have instead. Rav Wasserman said, people want to be popular. People want to be sociable. So how are rabbis today being sociable? How are they being popular? About a week ago, this team of Rishayim called One for Israel, which I've spoken to you about in the past, this is Israeli Christian missionaries. Probably the most aggressive missionaries in the world. Unfortunately successful, and unfortunately no end to their budget. They have a very different approach than most Christians have had in history, in that unlike the Christians of the yesteryear that simply killed a bunch of Jews, that stopped Baruch Hashem, but then now, for the last, let's say, 40, 50 years, Christian missionaries would approach the Jewish people by pretty much sneaking into their neighborhoods, trying to convince them that they don't know something, trying to convince them that some moron that died 2,000 years ago is really the Mashiach, he's really this, he's really that, and confusing a bunch of ignorance because that's how their religion is built, based on ignorance. They started with ignorant, illiterate people, and... It mostly, that's who they're recruiting today. Unfortunately, they succeeded in recruiting almost a half a million Jews in the last 25 years to convert to Christianity. Hashem Ishmo. Now, that was the approach. It was sneaky, nice. They gave some money. They uh, helped you with your bills, paid your uh, tuition, whatever you needed. Just keep coming to the meetings. That's what the approach was. And these te this team of Reshaim has a different approach. What's their approach? Destroying Judaism by making it look absolutely ugly in everybody's eyes. Just like the Gemara in Masechet Sota says and Masechet Sanhedrin that at the time of Mashiach the righteous the Sofrim, the Sofrim are the people that are so righteous, the such Talmud Chamim, that they are able to count the letters of the Torah in their head. They know where everything in the Torah is. Are going to be despised. And that's what these people are doing. How are they doing it? Coming out with aggressive videos, attacking rabbis, saying certain things, or Gmarot that say certain things, or certain verses that say certain things that they are distorting in such a way where they're not telling you the true meaning of it. They're telling you what it looks like. So recently, this group of Reshaim took short 5-10 second clips of probably a half a dozen or a dozen speakers, strong speakers, Rav Mizrahi being one of them, Rav Gizi another one, Rav Shaulov, and a few others I don't remember. And they took four or five second clips where these rabbis were actually reading off Gmarot, or certain things in the Torah that talked about immor uh, immorality, immodesty, and things of that nature. And how a woman is obviously disgraced. She's a disgrace to herself when she's dressed like this. But they didn't explain all of that. And they made a video of this, one after another. So now, of course, a bunch of rabbis, or Ephraim uh, being one of them, uh, the organization Idabrut, and a few other rabbis came out with response videos to show the beauty of how, we, how Judaism and the Torah treats women better than any other religion in the world, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, the damage was already done. Now, if you are a decent rabbi, you speak against the missionaries, Right? If you are a little scared of your own shadow, you don't speak against them. Just stay quiet, but support the rabbis that are. Support the rabbis that are being, you know, going against and so on, right? What are rabbis in Florida doing? What are rabbis that are fakers looking for 
popularity doing, they're coming out with a different video. Video says, you know what? That video with those rabbis spoke about women like that. I'm rebuking them. They're wrong for saying that. They're going against their own and supporting the missionaries. Because you don't understand. Abat Israel is so holy. She's so great. Those rabbis should have never compared them to a cow. Those rabbis should have never said that they're going to get death penalty. Those rabbis... What do you mean? The Torah is saying it. The Torah is saying it. Not the rabbis. Rabbi is reading. No. But how am I going to become popular with the ladies if I don't say, no, ladies, I'm your man. I support you. Do whatever you want. Who are we? Oh, best yet, who are we to judge women and what, what clothes they're wearing? What do you mean, who are we to judge? We're not judge. We're just telling you, Allah is, if you're not a modest woman, you're not going to Gan Eden. How about that? For modesty. How about that for, 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 for judgment? If you're not a modest woman, don't even plan to go to Gan Eden. Don't pack your bags, nothing. Why? It's all going to get burned in your department. Chabal, give it to somebody. They could use it. Don't bring a pillow. Don't bring any covers. Don't bring nothing. If you're not, if you're not modest, don't bring nothing. Why? They're going to burn everything. That's not a judge. That's a reality. You play with fire, you get burned. That's a reality. It's not judging. But with this clown and other clowns like him, they want to be popular with the ladies. So what do they do? They go against their own people. So when someone comments on their video and says to this particular person, but Rabbi, these holy rabbis are reading from the Zohar. They're reading from the Gemara. They're not making this stuff up. They're speaking against immodesty and immorality and intermarriage. What do you say about it? He says to them, yes, I understand they're saying it, but there's a way to say it in a way of love. Who are we to judge? We're not in their place. Hashem Yishmo if this is our rabbis. But that's what we have, Rabbi. We have a situation where rabbis are looking to be popular so they don't care about teaming up with the Christians. The same Christians that are making fun of the Torah. Now if that's not enough, if you remember a couple of weeks ago I told you about a idiot from uh, New York who happens to be a rabbi that brought a pastor to his community in New York City. Right? Well, apparently he's not alone. Chabad wants to join him. Chabad in uh, Atlanta has an event, a remarkable story of an unlikely trio who brought hope and healing to a divided city. An event calling Healing the Divide. What is Healing the Divide? What's Healing the Divide? It's how Dr. Paul Chandler, Reverend Richard Green, and Dr. David Laz, how they're all teaming up together, the Christian, the Jew, but not just any Christian and Jew. Now he's a... Uh, you know, he's a Christian in the computer department and the Jew is in the, uh, I don't know, the drinks department. No, no, no. He's a reverend, mean, a picolus, machtia rabim, tries to destroy Judaism, and he's a Jew. Oh, yeah. what, 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 why, why do you see anything wrong with this? Don't you think this should be at a shul? It's a perfect event for a shul. Unity with the Christians. Show them that See, we can be friends after all. Even though, see, you're, you're God. Yoshki was a Jew after all, right? He's like us. This Rabotai is being highlighted in a Jewish community in a Chabad house, a Shem Yishmol in Atlanta, Georgia. And they want to tell you that they banded together to bring the racial healing to a community, to a community in crisis. This duo, a trio, of different religions that are actually contradicting of each other, they want to show you how they can be friends. Where? In a synagogue. In a synagogue. 
Now, if they said they want to do this at Madison Square Garden, I most likely wouldn't even mention it. Because all types of foolish things happen in a place like that. But when you bring that to a synagogue, you're in essence putting a kosher stamp on it. Chabad is putting a kosher stamp on the fact that Christians and Jews should be teaching together, dining together, doing everything together. Now, that's a little bit of a problem because the Gemara Masechet Avu Dazara says that you're not allowed to have, so, have such events with the Christians. In fact, with the Goyim period. You're not allowed to have such events. You're not allowed to have a dinner, a festive meal with the Goyim. Unless they invite themselves and they're in a politically uh, strong position that could hurt you. But you can't invite your friend Jose and his cousin Vinny to your Pesach Seder. You can't do that. Why? Because what happens is he comes to the Seder, then he comes to the, to the Hanukkah party. Before you know it, your sister likes him. Why? She doesn't see any difference between him, her and Vinny. She doesn't see any difference between her and Jose. She doesn't see any difference between those people. Why? Why? What's the problem? He's, he's my brother's friend. He's my, bro, my, fa my father's friend. He's, he came to us for, for the Seder. You're creating intermarriage by not separating. Which means that when you bring Christians to a synagogue, you are not only going against Allah, you're not only going against the sages, you're not only going against the Shem, but you're also going against yourself. You are breeding intermarriage within your own community, within your own household. And unfortunately, this is happening more and more now. There's not enough manpower and uh, in the, in the, that we have to fight every one of these battles, but we bring them up anytime we find out about them. And this is happening for one reason and one reason only. Rabbis have become dogs. Rabbis have become dogs that are trying to please their master. Now, so people are not offended by the comparison. Rav Wasserman compared them first. But also, another comparison would be a jester. You guys know what a jester is? Jester is like a clown. Tries to amuse you. Tries to do all types of things. Jokes sometimes, maybe a trick. Handstand, do a few flips maybe, juggle, fire, all types of things, whatever is going to entertain the crowd. Now when he's a jester, that's what you're paying him for. But when the jester is really a rabbi, that's a problem. Today, that's what Rav Wasserman is saying is happening. The rabbis have turned into jesters. They've turned into clowns that are constantly focused on pleasing the crowd in every way, shape, or form. What? You guys are bored? Okay, I'll bring you some uh, self-help guru that's not even a Jew, maybe from Catholicism, that's going to give you guys a lecture about confidence and uh, whatever else he has to say, maybe about Yoshka too. What? You guys are bored? You don't like my drashot? You don't like me talking about Moshe Rabbeinu? Okay, you know what? I'm going to bring you a, uh, you know, a reverend. I'm going to bring you a self-help guru. I'm going to I'm gonna bring you uh, some sex therapist. Toivat Hashem. I'll bring you something to entertain you. And they bring all types of people that are forbidden by the Torah. The Boca Raton Synagogue had this woman, uh, whatever her name is, she's like 900 years old. And she caused more men to sin than probably any woman in recent history. Dr. Ruth, I think her name is. They had her on the front stage next to the Aron Kodesh. Shmuli Boteach, pro-homosexuality, front row tickets, several events, Bo Boca Raton and many other places around the world. How do you think he pays for all of, this, all of his mentions? It's not just the books. Not just the books. People are hosting these Reshaim. Why are they hosting the Rashaim? Because the Kila, the community, is so ignorant, they don't know the difference between right and wrong. Because the shepherd, the leader, is not really telling them. What are you telling them? What do you guys want? I'll bring it for you. 
What are you guys in the mood for? In the UK, in, in, uh, I think it was uh, Manchester, that Rashad Dwick, he says, what are you guys in the mood for? You want to start a book club? Okay, we'll start a book club, a secular book club. I'll be the first to recommend the books. What's the first book he recommended? He, the rabbi of the Kila, recommended. A book you're not even allowed to read. That's what he read. That's the first book they went over. Fifty Shades of Gainum. Rabbi. Gets paid a million and a half dollars a year to take his entire Kila to Gainum. At least do it for free. This is what's happening around the world. When you see these unusual events in your community, know this. You do not have a rabbi. You have a jester. You have an entertainer. You don't have a rabbi. If the rabbi is loved by everyone, the Gemara itself says it's a problem. Why? It's not possible for a rabbi to be loved by everyone. Because if he's rebuking them and telling them the truth, surely some people are not going to like him. But that's a good sign. But if everybody likes him, that means that he's not rebuking everyone. That means that he's turned into a jester. And the Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says, people that are jesters, the beginning of their punishment is suffering in this world. Beginning. And the end of their punishment is suffering as well. So... Here we see, Rabotai, that you have yourself a very serious problem because you have a generation that has some major chachamim. You have some big rabbis in the world, but unfortunately, most people don't listen to them. They only listen to them when it's convenient. When it's convenient, they listen to them. But in reality, they don't listen to them. Then you have the clowns, the jesters, that are infiltrated practically every community. Guy comes to a rabbi and says, Rabbi, listen, we have these CDs that can help people do tshuva and uh, get chizuk from Gamabrit. No, 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 we don't teach that over here. Uh, that, exactly, you don't teach that over here. That's why I brought the rabbi that is teaching it. Because, you see, you have 200 kids in a neighborhood, teenagers, Every single one of them. Every single one of them is addicted. Because you don't teach it. So I didn't want to tell the rabbi what to do, what to teach. So what did I do? Try to help the kila. I bought it. And I'm bringing it for free. So people can tell you. No, 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 no. It's going to scare them. It's gonna, what do you mean? What do you mean it's going to scare them? What are you to tell people? If they're drinking poison, you tell them, no, no, no. Leave them alone. Don't tell them not to drink it. Why? Because if you tell them not to drink it, it's going to get scared. Let them enjoy it's like the craziest thing in the world. People are so worried about everyone's comfort and convenience and entertainment value that they've turned into jesters. Now, this leads to a lot of problems. Wasserman continues and he says, when Haman sets himself up against Israel, as the Gemara in Masechet uh, uh, Sanhedrin says, En Ben David Ba, that Ben David, the Mashiach is not coming until Am Yisrael does tshuva. But that is a Machalokit. One of the uh, sages says, Am Yisrael is not going to do tshuva. It's never going to be that everybody's going to do tshuva. Never going to be. So, Rabbi Yosho Ben David says, if they don't all do tshuva. They don't do tshuva. Hashem is going to send them a vicious leader like Haman. Hitler. Nebuchadnezzar. That's going to force them to do tshuva. So Rav Wasserman says that when a Haman, when such a leader, sets up himself against Israel, we must know that this Haman is nothing other than, the, than a heaven-sent rod to smite us with. It says, any time you see the guy from Iran saying that he wants to destroy Israel, or you see some other 
anti-Semite, saying he wants to destroy Israel. Don't be fooled. It's not him. Don't focus on him. Don't be scared of him. Don't even pay attention to him. Pay attention to who allowed him to do what he's doing. As it says in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 10, verse 5, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. My wrath is a staff in their hand. Against the hypocritical people shall I send them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to the prophet, You see this Assyria? You see this vicious monster that wants to destroy Israel? It's really me. It's really my rod that's hitting Israel. Who is it hitting? The hypocritical people. The people that looked religious, but they're not. The people that acted religious, but only when it was convenient for them. The people that were generous for the wrong reason. The people that did what they did, but not really. All those hypocrites. Those Rishayim that led them. He wanted the rabbi position, not because he wanted to help people. He wanted the rabbi position because rabbi position sometimes has a lot of connections. Connections to money, connections to this, connections to that. Nice reputation. So Hashem says, Oh, I Syria, rod of my wrath. My rod is a staff in their hand. And Rav Wasserman continues saying, no good can come from combating the rod. Does God lack any rods? God has many messengers. We must find methods of preventing the people being used as rods against us. In the days before Mashiach, common sense will be lacking. And like a crazy dog, they will bite the stick. He says to us, plain and simple, there's going to be many different messengers from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Whether it's Iran, or the Palestinians, or it's some other anti-Semite, or it's going to be COVID-19, or 17, or 12, or financial crisis, or the uh, uh, APA, um, what is it, uh, um, a, a staff, AFAT, whatever it's called, there's a bunch of hooligans that are destroying everything, the BDS, CNN, New York Times, all of these different things. These are all my staff. AFAC. AFAC. Fat Club. Twinkie. What do you want from me? <laughs> These people are all Kadosh Baruch Hu's staff. Uh, Rod. That's who they are. They're all Kadosh Baruch Hu. Now, the Wasserman is explaining to us focusing our time and attention to fight these people, to fight the rod, nothing good is going to come out of it. Aside from it being a waste of energy, it's going to lead to a lot of confusion. Because people are going to think that it's anti-Semitism that's the problem today. That it's COVID-19 that's the problem today. We should all make Aliyah. Because it's COVID-19, anti-Semitism, anti-this, anti-that. How come, how come none of this was a problem four months ago? How come none of this was a problem a year ago? How come none of this was a problem two years ago? How come? Where did all of a sudden happen? What, a Kadosh Baruch who just is bored? Nah, see, my kids are having too much fun. Let's mess with them. See what happens. Let's kill a bunch of them just to see what happens. Why wasn't this a problem a year ago, two years ago? We are obligated to evaluate our actions of what happened before in order to know what led to today. 
Now, if we had the appropriate leaders instead of jesters, they would tell us, our yeshivot have become a joke. If you don't have any money, they're willing to throw you out, even though Allah says they're not allowed to throw you out. If you want to be a modest girl, you're not going to be accepted in most of these seminars. Why? Modesty is not allowed. They tell you, oh, wear a skirt. Make sure the skirt covers like parts of the knee. Yeah, but that's not really modest. It's supposed to be to cover the whole leg. No, 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 that's too much. You are too religious for us. We we'll won't accept you with such a long dress. We we'll won't accept you with such a long dress. If you're a Sephardi, if you're Ashkenazi, if you came from this one, from that one, Yeshiva became a joke. The teachings have become problematic. You have Christian missionaries teaching inside Yeshivot. Countless stories that I have, first, first-hand knowledge. Woman from here in Florida called me one day crying. Said my my my, my nine-year-old kid just came home telling me about Yoshke. I said, what public school does he go to? She goes, he doesn't go to public school, he goes to a yeshiva. This is happening. So you see what's happening in our yeshivot. Then you see about all of, obviously, unfortunately, this whole child molestation situation that we have, this pedophilia filth that's happening in practically every community, and no one seems to be doing anything about it, or at least not enough. You have the education becoming a complete disaster. On top of that, the shuls have become a playground. Many shuls are having basketball courts. They're adding basketball courts to shuls. Instead of adding another shul, instead of adding another good rabbi, instead of adding more kedusha, we're adding basketball courts. And how are you going to hire the rabbi? Uh, the rabbi that's the tallest because he's going to have to play basketball with the kids. So guess what? Akadosh Baruch says yeshivas like this, I don't want them. So we already started having problems with yeshivot over the last year because of what the government wants to do in California, in New York, soon to be nationwide, Hashem Yishmo. The shuls, you keep telling everybody, oh, look, look at the sticker on the wall, look at the sticker on this, look at the, don't speak while you're in shul. Yeah, yeah, don't speak while in shul. They're speaking about this in shul. Yeah, yeah, don't speak around shul. Yeah, but you're saying don't speak in shul while you're in shul. You're talking about not talking in shul when you're in shul. Yeah, but I'm talking about a good thing, no? Rabbi, can you do me a favor? Can you tell the keilah to... Uh, not talk during prayer? No, no, no. They're not going to come back if I do that. Synagogue has become a joke. An entire group of young men did tshuva, coming to the shurim here. Started keeping Shabbat, keeping mitzvot, keeping this, keeping that. They started going to shul. Rabbi tells them, wow, who are you? What are you? Do, do, do. Oh. Where you... Who? Huh? Oh, Rabbi Ron? No, no, don't go to him anymore. Don't go to him anymore. The only reason they came to him is because they came to our shiurim. Only reason. But after they came to him, he told the group, 15, 20 guys, stop coming to the shiurim. Why? Jester. The jester told them not to come. So guess what? Don't make chalash about again. And this, unfortunately, is happening day after day. Because people are looking to become popular, because people are looking to be nice, you know, uh, good with the ladies, because people are looking for money, all of this self-interest that Rav Wasserman has been telling us about for the last few weeks is happening in our world today. Now, you would think that some of the bigger rabbis, the bigger leaders, perhaps the more popular ones, will do something about it. So Rav Wasserman continues and he says... Our new leaders have declared war against powerful nations. What is our power and strength? Newspaper articles are like cannonballs which we aim at the enemy. What can be the outcome? 
they serve only to kindle the wrath of the serpents against us. The leaders see only the rod and refuse to recognize the smiter. As it says in the prophet Isaiah 9.12, the people return not to him that smites them. He says that, look what we have today. Instead of having your rabbi, your local, your leaders try to tell people it's time to do tshuva, look, the world is collapsing, we have sickness, we have intermarriage, we have no end to the problems. It's time to do tshuva. What do they do? Did you guys read my article on, uh, on uh, Israeli Times? Did you guys read my blog? Did you guys read my, uh, did you should watch my interview? I was on CNN. Did you guys see me on CNBC? Did you guys see me on Channel 7? Did you guys see the, they, no, no, no. they write articles, they write blogs, they put it on the internet. And they're like, oh, that's my chizuk. They go on to secular media as they publish their articles, their opinion about the world, their opinion about into, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the religions and how we could all unite. All types of nonsense. That's our weapons. That's what they're using as our weapons. That's what the jesters are doing. Why? Because... When you go on a major network as a speaker, they interview on CNBC, they interview you on CNN, guess what? The competing channel also wants to interview you now. Now when you go on two channels, guess what? A third channel wants you also. By the time you get to the fourth channel, somebody's giving you a book contract. Somebody's giving you a book contract. Hey, listen, Rabbi, what's your name again? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Listen, Rabbi, we'll give you 25000 to write a book about whatever it is that got you on this TV. How about that? And the rabbis are doing it over and over again. Why? Because that's their job. To please the crowd, to be popular. So of course if you want to be popular, you cannot tell people what the Torah says about someone that drives on Shabbat. You cannot tell the people that, listen, if Moshe Rabbeinu was here and he saw you driving, he would, tell, he would command every one of us to stone you to death. Moshe, Isha Elokim. The master of all prophets, the only one that spoke to HaKadosh Baruch face to face. No one can challenge Moshe Rabbeinu. One person tried, his name was Korach, he's still in Gainom till this day screaming about it. Him and all of his followers. If Moshe Rabbeinu was here today and he saw your Keilah all driving on Shabbat, he'd bring a bunch of different Tamidei Chachamim with stones, with boulders to kill every single one of them. Show me a rabbi that's doing that for his keilah. Let them know about Moshe Rabbeinu. Show me a rabbi that's telling his keilah, listen, your son, your daughter, your friend, your colleague, he's homosexual, he's got serious problems with Hashem. That's one problem. That doesn't mean that he has to share the problem with the rest of us. He's allowed to come to shul. We're not going to kick him out. But he better act like a normal person. If he starts coming to shoe with a skirt and with makeup on, tell him to go to his uh, boyfriend's house. Don't come here with this filth. There's no acceptance of that disgusting behavior. No tolerance. No tolerance of that behavior. Want to come to shul? Want to do tshuva? I'll be the first one to help you. But you want to come with, a, uh, with, your, with your boyfriend? No acceptance. You tell this in a kila to throw you out. So you know what Melvis did in, in, in London? He wrote an entire book of how we should accept the homosexuals. Why? That gets popularity. That got him on more TV shows. That got him more and more and more people's good list. That's what a jester does. That's what a showman does. But unfortunately, Rabotai, for us, if we don't do enough is that these jesters are not giving endless amount of time to continue ruining the world. At some point, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to take revenge against the jesters and I will take care of my own sheep. But unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of suffering beforehand. Now, 
when you tell people that all of this happening in the world today, anti-Semitism increasing, disease, financial crisis, these are all signs from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. These are all rods that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is using in order to bring us closer. Where else do we see this from? In Psalm 23, verse number 4, David the Melech says, Shiftecha o mishantecha, ema ina chamuni. You, your rod, your staff, that will bring me comfort. They will bring me comfort. Now, why would a rod and a staff bring David the Melech comfort? Now, a staff, I understand. Because David the Melech says, I'm a sheep, I know nothing. Staff's going to tell me where to go. Should I go to shul? Should I go learn? Should I go back home to my wife? Take care of my kids? What should I do? Staff's going to tell me what to do, where to go, where, who to be friends with, who not to be friends with, what's allowed, what's not allowed. The staff, Rabotai, is the Torah. What's the rod? The rod is Yisurim, suffering. So why is the Vida Melech saying that the suffering as well as the Torah is giving him comfort. If he just said that the staff is giving him comfort, that the Torah is giving him comfort, he's enjoying learning, that's easy to understand. But that's not what he's saying here. David Melech is saying, Hashem, I want you to know that when I'm in a value of shadow of death, when I'm in Gainom, when I'm suffering, when the Erev Rav is attacking me in all ways, when they're trying to destroy me, they're trying to go against me. That's the rod. I know it. And the staff, that's the Torah. Both of those, they give me comfort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all that suffering. Why? The Klosenberg Rebbe, Allah Shalom, he was an Ish Kodesh that built entire communities in Germany, in America, in Israel, especially in Netanya. During the Holocaust, he lost 10 of his kids and his wife. And there was one child left. While he's in the Holocaust, while he's in the death camps, someone comes to the Klosenberg Rebbe and tells him, Kvod Rav, I just saw your 11th child, your last son, get murdered by the Nazis. Shem Yishmo. And people that were there that witnessed this, they saw that the Rav initially was shocked, but moments later, literally, almost as if it was within the same thought, went back to being the Rebbe, comfortable, happy, Shtabach Shimon. In the Holocaust. We're having a tough time being happy with no Holocaust. He's okay in the Holocaust. Why? He's a Kadosh Baruch Yeah, but you just found out that your last son out of 11 just got murdered. What are you happy about? So they asked, Kvod how is it that you're like this? You just found out your last, your last son just died. He says, I'll give you an analogy. He says, imagine there was a father and a son went into the woods for a trip. And, you know, the son said, ah, I'm going to go play a little bit in the woods. Okay, so he went playing in the woods. And the father just sat there in the camp. And the son was curious and he went start following a trail, and then he saw some fruits, and he saw a butterfly, and he started following the butterfly. And before you know it, he started, he got pretty far away from where the camp was. And he didn't know how to come back. And it started getting dark. And he started getting scared. He started hearing sounds, all types of animals. He, doesn't, he can't see stuff. And it's getting darker and darker fast. And he's little. And he's vulnerable. And he has nowhere to go. And all he can do 
is just simply wait for light to come up if he's even going to survive. Suddenly, out of nowhere, where it's become darkest, he gets a hit on his back. Pah! He gets scared. And he runs away from it, but then he turns around like, what just hit me? A bear, a polar bear, a panda bear, a giraffe, a bee, what is it? And so he turns around after he runs away, he turns around, he says, son! Oh, oh, it's Abba. And he runs back. Why do you run back? Because he knows it's Abba. The Klosenberg Rebbe says, when you told me that my 11th son was murdered, I got shocked. It was the darkest thing I've ever heard in my life. My last son was the darkest thing I've ever seen. The darkest moment of my life. But then I looked, who just hit me this hit? Who just hit me? Where did this come from? And I looked behind me and I said, oh, it's Abba. It's Abba. Oh. Okay, ah, it's Abba. Thanks, Abba. Baruch Hashem, Abba. It's Abba. There's no reason to be scared anymore. Why? Because whatever he's doing, he's doing it. It has to be the best. It has to be good. It's Abba. What's the question? David Amalekh is telling us, Rabotai Yikarim, Shiftecha o Mishantecha Ema Yinachamuni. It's not just about the staff, the staff that's going to direct you, but rather the rod. The rod sometimes comes before the staff. Before you're able to learn Torah, sometimes you have to go through some suffering. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to give you a few surgeries to humble you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to take a bunch of stuff from you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to make you realize you have nothing but Him. So He does you a favor and He puts you in a very, very dark alley. A place you have nowhere to turn. A place you feel alone. A place you feel miserable. A place you don't think you're going to survive. And he gives you hits and hits and hits after hits in order to make you realize you're not alone. It's Abba. David Melech says, when I know that it's the, the rod is from you, that gives me comfort. Yeah, it hurts. But it gives me comfort. Why does it give me comfort that it's, your, uh, that it's you? Because it's not the rod. It's who the rod belongs to. It's that, it's not that I want the rod. It's that I want your rod. Once it becomes your rod, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's a good rod. If it's somebody else hitting me, no, it cannot be good. But what if it's you hitting me? You're Abba. You're Abba. Once it's your rod, Ishtabach Shimo. There's no better rod in the way. It might as well be the staff once it's your rod. Whether it's your rod or your staff, it's you anyway. I can't wait to spend time with you. That's what a person needs to understand about the situation that is happening today. The problem that we have is that we do not have enough teachers to tell us what Rav Wasman was trying to tell us, what David Melech was trying to tell us. And the reason why, Rabotai, is not just because the world is full of jesters that are looking to become popular, are looking to become rich materially. It's not just because of that. But rather because there's a lack of understanding of what's required to be a real shepherd. The Sefer, Aroya Neeman, the... Uh, Admo Mikalmish, who uh, wrote a sefer called Sefer Esh Kodesh, not uh, Roy Neman, that's just a section. He was in the Holocaust as well, the Admo Mikalmish, and uh, he would give shurim inside the death camps. 
And this uh, sefer called Esh Kodesh, he also wrote another sefer called the uh, Chovat Talmidim. He, uh, this sefer is full of lectures that he gave inside the death camps, inside the Holocaust. And he writes that when a person delves into who the tzaddikim are, he realizes how far he is from being a tzaddik. Now, his father, the Admol, said something very interesting that's actually quoted in this sefer. And he says that a moser nafsho be'ad Yisrael Gadol mina moser nafsho be'ad Hashem levad. Someone that sacrifices his life for the sake of Am Yisrael is greater than someone that sacrifices his life for Hakadosh Baruch Hu himself. Now, at first look, this looks strange to us. What do you mean? You sacrifice your life for Hashem? This the dies of Kiddush Hashem. That's the highest level. That Mo says, no, it's not the highest level. Highest level is someone that sacrifices for the sake of Am Yisrael. But not dying like someone's killing you so you save another life. Living. Living with sacrifice for the sake of Am Yisrael. Why? Because a person that's Moser Nafsho for the Ben Amelech, for the son of the king, proves how much he loves the king himself. Because he doesn't only love the king, but he loves the king so much that he loves his children just as much as the king and he's willing to sacrifice life for them too. When a person understands what the value is of sacrificing your life for the sake of Am Yisrael, that it's actually much greater than sacrificing yourself just for Hashem himself. He says, then you are already on the right path, the Admo says, of being a rabbi. But how many people are really willing to sacrifice their life for Am Yisrael? The Midrash asks, how come Am Yisrael was in a, Egypt for 210 years? Slaves for most of it. Slaves for 116 years. How come? Midrash answers, because no one was willing to sacrifice their life to take them out of Egypt. Which means, if Moshe Rabbeinu did not come along and put his life on the line day after day, for the sake of Am Yisrael, every single one of us would still be in Egypt right now, 3,000 years later. If it wasn't for Moshe Rabbeinu, Am Yisrael would have never left Egypt, never left slavery. That's how great Moshe Rabbeinu was. And you can say, maybe somebody else would have come later on, not possible. Because the only reason anyone else was great after Moshe Rabbeinu was due to what Moshe Rabbeinu did in the first place, which is take out Am Yisrael from the desert, from, the, uh, from Egypt, bring them to Mount Sinai, give them the Torah, and then Ishtabach Shimon you have the instructions, the blueprint from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's when you can become great. Before that, no one was able to do it. How many people want to be Moshe Rabbeinu? People like to be called Moshe. People want to be treated with the kavod of Moshe. But how many are willing to sacrifice their life like Moshe was? Now, the Admami Kalmish also writes in his Sefer that there was one time a Hasid of his that was in jail and uh, the reason was because he was uh, supposed to be uh, going and in, drafted into the Polish army and that mall which was, was very very young at the time 
he gathered a ton of money and spent a ton of money bribing whoever possible to get this young man out of the draft into the Polish army. And many people disagreed with him. So what's the big deal? Let him go to the Polish army. It's better than him going to jail. It's better than him getting killed by the, by, by the, by the Goyim. What's the big deal? Why are you spending so much money on it? It's better he doesn't go, but if he's going, why are you spending all this money? Maybe you could use it to build something, spread more Judaism. Why are you spending so much money for this one Hasid? It's only one guy. Dadmos says, any rabbi that's not willing to put himself inside the bottom of Gehenom for any one of his Hasidim is no rabbi at all. If you're not willing to go inside Genom itself to go save one of your Hasidim from the fire, you should not be allowed to be called a rabbi. A rabbi is not a title you get after you pass a bunch of tests. A rabbi is not something you get because you have to happen to be working in a building that maybe you own it or maybe you don't. A rabbi is not something you just add to your business card and therefore you're a rabbi. A rabbi is not something you can just simply decide, I'm going to be a rabbi from today on. What a rabbi really is, that most says, is a certification that you are willing to go inside Genom to go save one of your Hasidim, to go save one of your Talmidim. That's what you're willing to do. And if you're not willing to do it, you're not allowed to be called a rabbi. You're not a rabbi at all. Why? Because in order to be a manhig, a leader, a shepherd, first rule is sacrifice. Now if you don't know what the value of sacrifice is, that Mo already told you. To sacrifice yourself for the sake of Am Yisrael is greater than sacrificing yourself for Hashem. Because it shows Hashem how much you love Him. Now, how many people are willing to sacrifice themselves? Some, but not enough. Now, one time, he writes here that they had a situation One of the, uh, it was a Shabbat Shuvah, and the Admor got very sick. He wasn't able to move. He wasn't able to speak. He had an infection in his lungs that was debilitating him. So even though it was usually scheduled to give a big lecture for Shabbat Shuvah, he wasn't able to do it. But then days before the lecture, he found out that one of the rich people in the Jewish community decided that he's going to open up his business from now on on Shabbat. And he told him, yeah, but the Rebbe is going to go against you. He says, if the Rebbe, tell the Rebbe for me, message for me, if he says one thing, about my business being open on Shabbat, I'm going to go to my contacts in the government and they're going to remove him from his rabbinical position. He's going to lose everything. So when the Rebbe found, about, found out about this, he immediately gathered his strength, went from one community to another, one keila to another, and told them, we're going to have this lecture. And on that lecture, he screamed his lungs out about the significance of Shabbat and how they're all supposed to go against this rich guy before he destroys all of Judaism. So much so that everyone in the room, hundreds of people, all agreed to go against this rich kofil. 
And he writes that the last part of the lecture was, he says, when I first started dealing here with the issues of fixing the Shabbat problem, they, they sent me messengers from the Rabbanut that telling me that if I continue, they're going to remove, my, remove me from my position. These are drunk people if they think that they're going to scare me. If they think that they're going to bother me at all by taking away my rabbinical position. Don't they know what every Israeli, what every Jew actually means with his responsibility for Hashem when he says Shema Yisrael? When you say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, what are you saying? Akadosh Baruch Hu, at this moment, where I'm uni uniting your name, unifying your name, what am I really doing? I'm saying to you, Akadosh Baruch Hu, right now, I'm willing to get cut open into 500 pieces for your name. I'm willing to get thrown off of a building for your name. I'm willing to go into a holocaust day and back 50 times for your name. I'm willing to die for your name every time you say Shema Yisrael. That's what you're saying. When you say Shema Yisrael, that's what you're saying. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm willing to get killed for your name. And I say this twice, three times a day, he says. Where have I say this? Every day I'm ready to get cut open 500 times. Every day I'm, getting, I'm ready to get murdered for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And they think they're going to scare me by some rabbinical position. These are drunk people, he says. When a person understands that a Jew is willing to get burned alive for the sake of Hashem's name, they would never insult him with such a warning. He says, I'm not looking for a fight but what has to be done has to be done when a person is worried about his job he's not going to be able to rebuke the people or tell the people what they're supposed to hear when a person is scared for their own pocket they're not going to be able to do their job the way that they're supposed to because the sacrifice that's required means that you have to be willing to fulfill the life not only as a Jew, but also as a leader that has much more to lose when it's concerning the neshamot as a consideration than the bank account. Meaning you have to care a lot more about the neshamot than you care about the bank account, the popularity, and so on. Now, you can say, okay, maybe this is just for some people, but not every rabbi has to be like this. But here's the problem. That's not what it says. In a Midrash Rabbah, in Sefer Vayikra, Parashat Kedoshim, Rabbi Tanchum, Rabbi Chia says the following Lamad Adam Velimed Veshamar Veasa Vaita Safek Beyadolim Chot Velomicha A person, a rabbi, that learned and taught and kept and observed. But there was an opportunity for him. To rebuke, and he didn't rebuke. To support someone that rebukes, and he didn't support someone that rebuke. He didn't rebuke, that's already a problem. But he had at least, okay, I'm not, I'm not good at rebuking, some people say. I'm not good at it. 
So bring the rabbi that does rebuke. He had an opportunity. No, 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 no. Don't bring him. Don't bring him. But overall, he learned the Torah. He taught the Torah. He kept the Torah. He observed the Torah. He did everything. Tzaddik. But he's just missing one ingredient. Rebuke. He's not rebuking. And he's not bringing any rebukers. This person, this rabbi is Aru, has the worst curse in the entire Torah. Even though he learned Torah his entire life, he finished the Shas a thousand times. Even though he taught the Shas a thousand times. Even though he kept all of the mitzvot, Sukkot, Pesach, Yom Kippur, Ishtabach Shemot, Shabbat, everything. He kept everything. One mitzvah was missing. He didn't rebuke, and he didn't bring anyone to rebuke. The Torah, Kedoshah, tells us, he's not, no, not only is not a tzaddik, he's arul, the worst curse in the Torah. What does it mean? What does it mean to be arul? The parasha in the Torah tells us, when a person, lo mekim, lo machzik divre Torah, aruru, v'kol ha'am omer amen, when someone is not supporting the Torah, and because of that, he's called Arur, the entire nation says Amen. That means that when it was decreed in Shemaim that this person had an opportunity to rebuke somebody, because he saw and he knows this guy drives on Shabbat, and he didn't say nothing. And then somebody from Be'ez Hashem contacted him and said, listen, we're in your area, we're willing to give a shield for free. He says, no, 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 not for us. He didn't want to bring you. At that moment, at that moment, Adam Rishon, Noach, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, Shaul HaMelech, all of the Tzadikim, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Shemo Ba Yochai, Rabbi Mir Baal Anes, Rabbi Lazar Ben Azariah, every Rabbi, every Tzadik, the Baba Sali, Every single rabbi in the history of mankind, a tzaddik, at that moment, says Aru, and everyone says Amen. Why? Not only you didn't do, did do the job, you didn't do the job, not only that, not only you didn't save the neshamot that a Kadosh Baruch Hu put in your hands, but you didn't even let anybody else do it. And then the Midrash continues even further, scaring us even more, saying the following. This person is deemed Aru Asher Lo Ekim Divrei Torah Azot. The person that followed the Torah, learned the Torah, did everything but didn't rebuke, Aru. But what Rabbi Yeremiah says, Beshem Rabbi Chia, he says, a person that didn't learn, and he didn't really fulfill the entire Torah. And he didn't really observe all of the mitzvot because obviously he's not that learned. And he didn't teach anybody. But he saw somebody doing something wrong. He saw the guy driving on Shabbat. He said, hey, you know how to drive on Shabbat. You're a Jew. And he saw that the rabbi is coming into town. He said, can I help out? Maybe pay for the flight. Maybe pay for the room. Maybe uh, sponsor some CDs. I had an opportunity to support some Kiru. But he didn't learn. He wasn't a big tzaddik. He wasn't a big tummy chacham. He didn't teach anybody. He is basic, basic level Jew. Just keeps basic level. He keeps Shabbat. He's a kosher Jew, but nothing more than that. But he did rebuke when he had the opportunity and he supported the rebuker. This one is blessed. That means at that moment that he writes the check or he donates online or he buys a CD or he tells us somebody that if you continue violating Shabbat, Hashem is going to kill you. And he rebukes. The moment that he does it, because Hashem gave him the opportunity, Adam Arishon, Noach, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, 
דוד, שלמה, שאול המלך, רבי עקיבא, רבי שמעון בר יוחאי, רבי אלעזר בן עזריה, all of the צדיקים, the Baba Sali, רב עובדיה, all of the giants in history, at that moment says ברוך, oh, and everyone says אמן. The guy that learned to lie his entire life, but didn't rebuke, ארור, אמן. And the guy that didn't learn that much, but just kept basics, but he did support rebuke, ברוך הוא. That's how valuable sacrifice for the sake of Am Yisrael is. Why? Rebuke is not comfortable for anybody. It's mesirut nefesh. It's a sacrifice. Now, a person that doesn't rebuke, that wants to rebuke, always has this worry. What do I do if it's going to go wrong, right? We're going to finish off with this point. This point puts it all in perspective where the Sefer Shulchan, uh, Aruch HaShulchan in Krach Tet, at the end of it, in a section called Rashot Kol Ben Levi, in Drush Vav, says that Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu to please give him one thing. That all of the punishments that he would punish Am Yisrael for all of their sins to make something good come out of it. Now years later, years later, the Prophet Jeremiah in chapter 2, first few verses, He's talking about how Kadosh Baruch Hu is angry with Am Yisrael and is deciding to destroy the Bet HaMikdash. That means that millions of people are going to die. That means it's a nightmare of nightmares. Why? Am Yisrael was at the worst possible level they ever were. The worst sins known to man. They brought an idol inside the Bet HaMikdash. They were murderers. And on top of it, all types of immorality. You think it, they did it. So many words, not so different from today. Probably worse. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Jeremiah, do you know what I remember though? You know what I remember? I remember that when Am Yisrael was still young, they trusted me and they went in the desert and they will followed me for 40 years. That's what I remember. You would think, Hashem says, I remember Ami says, Reshaim, they, uh, they were in the desert. Two seconds after I told them Ten Commandments, they're worshiping an idol. Two seconds after I took them out of Egypt, they were complaining about food. Two seconds after they got out of there, they were complaining about the, uh, the man. They were complaining about water. That's what you'd say, I remember. Hashem says, I remember. Well, you're about to punish them. You're punishing them. That's what you should be remembering. Because Baruch says, no, no, no. I don't remember those things. And what I remember right now is that Am Yisrael followed me, blind faith in me, in the desert. Now, in reality... We weren't supposed to be in the desert for 40 years. It was because of our mistakes and our sins that we were in the desert for 40 years. Now Moshe Rabbeinu, as the Aruch HaShukhan says, asked Hashem for one thing. Hashem, please, they're going to make sins. I know it, you know it. But please, whatever sins they make, and you're going to punish them because you have to punish them, make something good come out of it. So as a result of all of these punishments, what really happened? We were in a desert for 40 years. That was a punishment. What came out of it? Every single day, manna came down. On top of it, every single day, the manna was programmed to know who's tzaddik, who's rasha. How? If it came right next to his door, that's because it's a tzaddik. If he had to walk a mile for it, that's because it's a rasha. Just the day before, it was a tzaddik. Today it was a rasha. The manna exposed him. 
Cause them to do tshuva, embarrassment. Where's your food, buddy? Ah, oh, you're rasha, aren't you? No, no, I eat it. Yeah, yeah, I eat it. Yeah, buddy. Six o'clock in the morning, eat it. Imagine that something like that today. Food shows up right at your door if you're tzaddik, and it's nowhere to be found if you're rasha. Hashem yishmor v'yatzil. Everybody do tshuva. Everyone do tshuva. That was a miracle. On top of it, you had a river following us for 40 years. The mountains would split open because the Aron HaKodesh would lead the way. The floor was paved. No one had to step on the floor because the clouds of glory would literally make everything perfect. Scorpions, snakes, anacondas, all types of giant creatures that were dangerous were not even allowed to come close to us. Best yet, no one had to go to the bathroom for 40 years. People with stomach problems appreciate this. You don't have to go to the problem. Why? The mana absorbed by your blood completely. No bathroom, 40 years. And no feeling over the bathroom. Perfectly healthy. You show up to Mount Sinai, you were missing an eye, now you have an eye. You're missing an arm, now you have an arm. Everyone was perfectly healthy. And the best part, 40 years, no one changed clothes. Why? The clothes grew with you and were brand new every single day. Now, all of this came from what? A punishment. A punishment. All of these miracles came from a punishment. Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu grant Moshe Rabbeinu his wish that out of the punishment, good's going to come? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell Jeremiah, Jeremiah, even though they're bad kids right now, murdering, raping, this, that, what I remember about them is that they trusted me to go in the desert. They trusted to go in the desert. Why? The answer to both is that when Am Yisrael trusted HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they didn't know how long they're going to be in the desert. They didn't know where they're going to go. They didn't know what they're going to eat. They didn't know if they're going to survive. They didn't know anything. They simply had emunah and Hashem, and that's all they had. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, when they had faith in me, and they were willing to make a sacrifice for me, I had to guarantee that only blessings will come out of it. So much so that even the punishment had blessings on them. So much so that the merit of them going into the desert outweighed all of the sins. And I remember it a thousand years later. The merit of us going into the desert still carries to this day. And that's for sacrificing ourselves for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What did Admo say to us before? He says, if the sacrifice for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is big, the sacrifice for his sons is even bigger. That's why he answered Moshe Rabbeinu's prayer. That's why when a person says, I'm going to step out there, I'm going to put myself at risk, I'm going to go to a place I don't want to go to, I'm going to do a job I don't really want to do, I'm going to help, help a bunch of people I don't really know. I'm going to do a bunch of different things I have no idea how to do, but I know HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants me to do it. I'm going to sacrifice myself for Hashem's kids. Money, time, health, everything. And I have nothing to be scared about. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you sacrifice yourself for me, guaranteed to have miracles. If you sacrifice yourself for my kids, it's even bigger. If all of those jesters only knew how many blessings you get for the sake of sacrificing yourself, for the sake of his kids in a real way, to save them from their troubles, to get them out of their troubles, to get them to know the Torah, every single one of those jesters themselves would start doing tshuva. The problem is, when we're too busy being jesters, looking for popularity, looking to appease everyone, we don't have time to learn any of this stuff. 
And a Kadosh Baruch Hu is not spoon feeding anyone this. This is why I tell you all the time you have to make sure that not only you don't have a rabbi that's a jester, you have a serious rabbi helping you, but even more than that, you have to go forward blind faith. He says, you do. Hashem says, you do. Gemara says, you do. Gemara says, if the rabbi says, it's the same thing as God says. Why? That's your leader. And if you don't have one, or your one is, that needs to be replaced because you're a jester, do it as soon as possible. But you have to make sure to do everything you can to support this as best as you can. Because that's the only thing you have that can guarantee you a life of miracles. Am Yisrael, unfortunately right now, Rabotai, is not at the best situation it's ever been in. We have quite a few Rishayim that are confusing the people day after day. If we don't start waking up and remove our ego and remove our impatience and seriously start taking into consideration that we have to care about our brothers and sisters more than we care about ourselves, we end up getting hurt more than everybody else. If you simply notice what's happening in the world, right now, a lot of the uh, problems are happening from liberalism, liberal Jews, lefty liberal type of mentalities. But who actually has all of the suffering? The right side. The problems are caused by the liberal mentality. But the ones that are suffering are really mostly the ones that are observing Torah, doing mitzvot. Why? Because the only reason why they're staying liberal, the only reason why they're staying secular, the only reason they're staying anti-Torah is because we're not willing to sacrifice our life for them. We're thinking, no, I'm going to sacrifice my life for my own family. No, I'll sacrifice my life for my own keilah. No, I'm going to sacrifice my life for my own uh, group. No, my friend. You have to be willing to sacrifice your life for Am Yisrael. If you want a life full of miracles. Now I know a lot of this stuff is new to you, to me, to everybody. But the situation is getting worse. We need to be smart. We need to not let things get to the point of a holocaust for us to wake up and take advantage of the things we have available to us for free today. So Rav Wasserman tells us, first and foremost, recognize who the jester is. Run away from them. Don't support them. Second of all, recognize who the martyr is. Who is willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice? Is he willing to sacrifice? Is she willing to sacrifice? Who is willing to sacrifice themselves for Am Yisrael? And that's the route you have to go. That's the route you have to go. You have to do your best. Sometimes you could do better, sometimes you could do less. But bottom line is you got to do whatever you can. Because that's the way to survive the nightmare that's going on in the world now and unfortunately what's happening. There's a lot more to say, but I think we're going to continue. There's other Shem next time. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.